Good evening. It's great to see everybody who's out about with us again this evening. It's been a, a beautiful day, but it's been a cold day. But hold on, I hear brighter days, warmer days are ahead. Just hold on, and it'll be here. I was talking to uh, my fishing buddy the other on Friday while we were sitting in the middle school. I was sitting in the middle school line. He wasn't. And uh, I, I told him about the, the way this weather was. He told me once, he said he was, he was training in Albuquerque. And he said he'd come in, you know, as he went into the facility, he'd rolled his sleeves up, and he was hot outside. He said about an hour later, somebody said it was snowing. He couldn't believe it. We looked out the window, and it was. I said, now, isn't that a change of events? Uh, but it is good to see everybody who's with us this, this afternoon, this evening. Uh, when we think about our lesson, we're going to continue on our study in Second Peter in chapter 1. And what we've been doing is talking about these what... Many people call Christian graces, Christian graces. And we'll go ahead and read the, the verses again to get them implanted back in our minds. Uh, first, second Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 5, it says, But also for this very reason, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will, need, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we've talked about several things over the, over the past couple of months about these, these verses, these ideas. The first thing, again, we looked at was giving diligence to this. It takes a little bit of work to do this. Uh, we have our faith. Our faith is that I believe in God and I seek after him. And that's that, those pieces that come together. Uh, from there, we add virtue, and virtue is doing the right thing. It doesn't matter where we are. We're trying to do the right thing. To virtue, we're adding knowledge. So as we continue to do the right thing, we're finding out more about who God wants us to be. Now, we've mentioned before this is a, a growing process. As I learn more about who God wants me to be, it builds my faith. As it builds my faith in who I should be, I hold myself to the standard to do what is right. That's virtue or integrity. And, and then I add more knowledge, and it goes into self-control. Now, I said before, this one is the one where people say you go from preaching to meddling. Because we have to go and tell ourselves no sometimes. And not only do we tell ourselves no sometimes, we also got to tell ourselves it's time to get off the couch, Go outside and do something. And that you, it's that control of self. And we don't like that very much. We kind of like to go on autopilot. Just whatever the day kind of gives us, we'll just put it on autopilot and we'll go this way and that way. But self-control says, I'm not doing that anymore. And I'm doing this today. Then we come to perseverance. Perseverance. Because self-control is hard. It is. It really is. How many of us like to tell self no? Okay, we don't like to do that very often, do we? You know, just think about it. If we're at the, the Thanksgiving table and there's still plenty on the plate, on the, on the di in the dishes, it, it continues, wants to be in our plate, and so we just keep grabbing the stuff. How many of us say, well, I don't think so. We'll have that next week. For the next week, right? We don't like that. We don't like to continually tell ourselves no. How, how many of us like to continually tell ourselves, you got to do this. you got to do this. It's time to do this. We don't like that. It's tiring work. It really is. And so we have this perseverance. Perseverance. It's the go, you know, it's our ability to continue going. Continue going. See, in any project, have you ever gotten to a project where, where you said, I can do this, it's no problem, and you start into the project, whatever it is, and all of a sudden we find out it's a little more work than we anticipated. And it would be so much easier to quit it and say, I never want to see that thing again. Right? I mean, we might, how many projects do we have that we have shoved in the back of a drawer somewhere? How many projects have we started last fall or last summer and said, I'll finish that later? But later never comes. And so when we start thinking about perseverance, it's what I would call going power. Going power. We've got to continually put off those things that hinder our walk 
And we've got to continue to add, to, add things to our lives so we're prepared to live a life that God would have us to live. And so perseverance keeps us in the path which we ought to go. It keeps us there. It's the going power. And so what I want to do a little bit this afternoon, this evening, is talk about what some things that continually give us going power or motivation to continue keeping on and not give up, but to keep walking toward the prize that lays up before us. The place I want to go this afternoon, this evening, is Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. What we find in Hebrews 11, there are two things here and one in chapter 12 that caused people to want to continue on. Because they wanted to continue on, we have their example to follow, and as we follow their example, we can gain go going power. And these things are almost revolutionary. What do you mean? When we think about the society we live in, why do people tell us we engage in the activities we should get engage in? Because it makes you happy. Because it makes you feel good. How many times do we engage in activities where I say, I'm going to do this today, but the benefit, the true benefit, is going to be years down the road. Years down the road. We might think about a retirement, but how many other things do we say, I'm going to do this today, and I'm going to benefit down the road, but I've got to keep my eyes on what that looks like. The first place I want to look is in Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 8. It's about Abraham. And notice what it says about Abraham. It says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place, which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So if you're an underlining, circling type person, highlighting, this is verse 10. It's verse 10. See, when we go back to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, God spoke to Abram. And he told him to leave his country, his father's house, and go to a place I'm going to show you. Now, could you imagine the conversation that Abram had with Sarah when he got home? Honey, I talked to God today, and he says that we need to leave everybody we know and go somewhere he's going to show us. You know what she probably said? Where are we going? Right? I don't know where we're going. Second question. Well, how are we going to get there? I imagine he said, I'm not sure. Have you ever been traveling like that? How do we get there? I don't know, but I know this road takes us over there, and so we're going to go. Abram left his father's house, left his country, the things that he knew that made him comfortable, and started walking a path where, you know, the, God's ways, where God wanted him to go. Now he goes to Haran, God talks to him again there, and he goes on into Canaan. But the idea is he gets up and he goes. Now, when he does this, I don't know if he knew how far it would take him. And I don't mean distance-wise. I mean really how far. I mean, here he is. He heads out and he goes to the promised land. He's there. He ends up down in Egypt. He gets thrown out of Egypt. He wanders around more. He ends up in Gerar. He gets thrown out of Gerar. He ends up in one war. He ends up fighting with, uh, with well, his herdmen and Lot's herdmen fuss and fight. And he ends up sending Lot off, who ends up getting captured. That's the reason he had to go to war, to get him back. I mean, you have all this happening. I doubt he knew that was going to happen when he set out. But that's what happened. Abram, why didn't you just go back home? Why didn't you say, I just want to be back there? Because that's the comfortable place. That's the place we ought to be. He was waiting for a city which has foundations and the builder and maker is God. 
He was looking for a place that was not on this earth. He was looking for a heavenly city. See, that's why, that's why he kept going. That's why he kept obeying. He was looking for a heavenly city. Now, how often do we sit back in, in our lives and we build our life around going to a heavenly city? We say, this is where I want to go. And this is the life I live because I want to go there. And it doesn't matter who makes fun of me. This is where I'm going. This is what I'm doing. And I want to take as many people there as I can. Now notice when we pick up in verse 13. We're going to read 13 to 16. And notice how he keeps emphasizing the, the desire of Abraham to continue on. The desire of Isaac and Jacob to continue on. Notice what he says in verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off or assured of them, embraced them and confessed there were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who, who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they came out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better that is a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. See the first thing when you look at that first going power. The, the motivating force is to get up and say. I want to look for a heavenly land. I want to look for a heavenly country. I want to look at a place where God is. And he's dwelling there. And I want to dwell with him. I want to look there. I mean, could you imagine wandering around as a pilgrim, a sojourner, a stranger? Just kind of pack around what you have with you from this place to that place, really not having an area to call your home because you're looking for a heavenly country? See, we spend most of our lives building our estate, worrying about what our estate looks like. What does our house look like? What does our bank account look like? What do our cars look like? What, does it, what is it am I going to leave to my children and grandchildren when I die and leave this place? That steals a lot of our focus. That shouldn't be a focus. That shouldn't be where we put all of our energy. That's where it goes. But it shouldn't be there. What would happen if we said, this earth is not my, this world ain't my, is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. We sing the song. What would happen if we lived the song? See, when we look to 2 Peter 3, what Peter does is he tells these people, these individuals he's writing to, these persecuted people, about a difference between what, is, what they've been going through and what they're going to have. And there are some people who are making fun of Jesus coming back because he's not come back yet. And so Peter goes on to say there's people who are scoffing. They, they forget the word of God. Notice what he says here in verse 10 in 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3, 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Everything that we've ever worked for one day will be gone. Solomon calls it vanity. Everything we put their energy into will be gone one day. It will not last forever. But you, but me, we will last forever somewhere. Notice how Peter goes on to say it. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for in the hastening coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. There's a heavenly country. There's a heavenly country, and it's there. And you and I can go there through and by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
But we got to look to that country, that heavenly land, to get through this into the next land, into the next life. There's a second thing. We go back again to the book of Hebrews and chapter 11. There's another, it deals with Moses. Now notice what he says here, starting in verse 24. So it's Hebrews 11, verse 24. It says, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than in the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now notice this. If you're looking at it, why did Moses do what he did? It's in, it's in verse 26. So if you're one of circling, underlining, highlighting type people, notice again, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, he looked for the reward. See, what Moses points to, what the Hebrew writer points to Moses, is he's looking for riches that are found in God. Riches that are found in Christ. He's looking toward there. Now, if you go back to Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, see, as the Hebrew writer points out in verse 23, Moses' parents hid him. At a time they were throwing babies in the river and having them killed, they hid him. And then they have his sister hide him in some bulrushes. Pharaoh's daughter finds him and pulls him out of the water. That's how we know him as Moses, because he got drawn out of the water. She saw him. She had compassion on him. I don't know why him versus all the other babies that were being killed. I don't know. But she had compassion. His sister went and got his mother. She became the nursemaid for her own son. He ends up being adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. He's raised as if he's her own. Which means one day he's in the line of succession. He, he could be the next Pharaoh. But one day he's out, and, he's, and in, in verses 11 through 15 of, of Exodus 2, he's out among the people. And he sees his taskmaster, and he's beating a Hebrew, and he kills the Egyptian and hides his body. He turned his back on the Egyptian, killed him, and hit him. The next day, there's two Hebrews fighting. And he stops them because they're brethren. And the question is asked, who made you ruler over us? And what, he's the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By that whole statement, he was higher than they were. He was in control of the situation. But then they asked, are you going to kill me like you did the Egyptian? Fears his life and runs off. Later, God calls him from a burning bush to go and lead his people out of Egypt. See, he had it made, if you will. He had all everything he would have ever wanted. Living in the house of the Pharaoh. He wouldn't have to do anything he didn't want to. But what did he decide to do? He decided to take care of his brethren. He decided to do something different. See, when we think about what it means to be a Christian, some, we, we neglect so many of the spiritual blessings that has been given to us. We think that we just kind of go throughout life and we're kind of a good person and, and we go throughout and that's just all it's about is meandering. But, but there's so, many, so much more they're living a Christian life and just kind of going through this way in life and that way and kind of staying out of trouble. There's so much more. See, notice what, what Peter, uh, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Notice how he goes on to say these spiritual blessings. Because in, in essence, when he says he's given every spiritual blessing to those in Christ, that means there's not one spiritual blessing we do not have. We have them all. Every single one of us has them all in Christ. Notice in verse 4, 
He chose us in Him. In Him. That's that relationship piece. If you're in Christ, you are a chosen person. Have you ever been sitting in a classroom or sitting on a sideline or sitting in an area where you said, I wish somebody would choose me? Have you ever been someone who wasn't chosen? See, in Christ, you're a chosen person. God chooses you in Jesus Christ. Notice before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Notice in verse 5, having predestined to us as adopt, to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. You've been adopted. You're part of God's family. Galatians 3.24, as many of us has been baptized in him, have put on Christ. We, that's how we become part of the family of God. We're brethren. Heirs of the according to the promise given to Jesus, we're there. We're his children. Notice at the end of verse 6, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Have you ever been in a place you felt out of place? Felt like you didn't belong there for whatever reason? There's going to come a great feast day, if you will, in heaven. You're going to have a seat there, and you shouldn't feel out of place because you're one of the guests of honor. You're accepted, not rejected. You're part of it. Part of it. In him we have redemption through his blood. We've been bought back by his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. There are people who want to live life normal and not carry the burden of sin and wrongdoing with them anymore. In Jesus, you have it. You have it. But I feel so guilty. Why do you feel guilty? Is it something God says, or have you not forgiven yourself over it? Why? See, you have the forgiveness. It's all there. Notice again in verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure with uh, which he purposed in himself. We're a knowing type people. We have the wisdom of God right here. How does God say live life? It's right here. You have access to it. It's not hidden. It's all here. He's made it known. Notice again in verse 11. In him, we all, in him also we have an obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be the praise of his, uh, of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What, you, we have an inheritance. Because Jesus died, we get a reward. Because he died, we get salvation. Because he heard the word of truth and we obeyed it, we get freedom in Christ. Those are great spiritual blessings. And if we're not careful, we walk around like this. And we don't want to look at nobody. And we feel like we're the worst people in all the world. And yet we're God's own special people. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. To proclaim his praises into the darkness. Now isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? We're so rich in Christ. And there are times we allow physical things to quench our spirit. Why do we do that? So we shouldn't. We shouldn't. You're God's special person no matter wherever you are. See, there's greater riches in Jesus than this world has ever to offer. Because they're all going away anyway. Like Solomon said, they grow wings and fly out the window in the morning. Have you ever got a paycheck and it gone? I believe it speaks the truth. But there's certain things nobody can take away from us. And that's an amazing, amazing thought. We're so blessed in Christ. If we and go back to Hebrews chapter, we'll look at chapter 12. So we're to look for that heavenly city. Look for that heavenly home. Anticipate finding it. 
We look for the riches of being found in Christ. Chapter 12 and verse 1, he's already talked about all these people. They died and suffered and things happened to them, but they're not going to receive the reward outside of you and I. Notice what he says in verse 1. Therefore, since, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance, perseverance, patience, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. See, when we look at Jesus, Jesus is totally different than the Messiah, Savior they were looking to come. They, they wanted somebody to be victorious and, and ride in and lead them to battle and destroy the Romans and give their country back. But that's not why Jesus was here. Truly, he was a king, but his, spirit, his kingdom's a spiritual kingdom. That's what he told Pilate. He come to deliver us from the greatest enemy we, you and I have ever owned. Our sins, the devil. See, he's come to set us truly free. That's why Jesus came. We can look at him. See, his life wasn't always easy. You remember how Jesus said it when Peter and John come to see him in John 1. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. See, he doesn't promise he doesn't promise every day it's going to be a fantabulous day. In fact, when we look in John chapter 15, this is what Jesus has to say about it. Starting in verse 18, he says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do for, to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. I notice that. Jesus said if they hate us, they hated him. If they hated him, they're not like us. I mean, that's the thing about truth, isn't it? And there was something I read the other day. It, it makes so much sense when we pay attention to it. Why did the crowd want Barabbas set free? Not because they loved Barabbas, but they hated the truth. They didn't want to hear what Jesus was trying to tell them or was telling them, and they didn't want to hear it. If he can continue and endure all the way to the end, if we can look to him, we can find it in the end too. You see, that'd be an awful hard life to live. But wait a minute. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us what? For the joy that was set before him, he did it for a reason. And it was to set us free. To set us free. Isn't that amazing? When we look at Galatians chapter 6, Paul encourages the brethren there. He starts out describing people in verse 1 that if they've been overtaken in some kind of trespass, those who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. So not we go there and we boldly say, you've done wrong. How many times do people walk up to us and say, you've done wrong, and, they, and as if they expect us to say, oh yeah, yeah, I, I did that. That's not how that works, is it? That has never converted anybody. So why do we do it? See, there's a spirit of meekness, a spirit of gentleness to bring them along. Why? Because all of us should carry our own load in verse 5. Notice what it says here in verse 6. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. 
Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Did you catch it? We'll reap if you do not lose heart. Persevere in doing the good things. Keep doing them. Don't stop short. Keep doing them. Because you'll reap if you don't lose heart. You know, have you ever sat and thought about it? Of all the people that listen to Jesus, how many do you find in the upper room praying? That's a good question, isn't it? I mean, you don't you feed five thousand men, not counting women and children. You say there's going to be a lot of people praying that first Sunday, twelve plus a handful more, his mother, his brothers. There's not that many, a hundred. I mean, it, five thousand men to a hundred. They all didn't follow either. But we will reap if we do not lose heart. If we continue on, we can make it. But we got to look to Him for that. We got to look to Him for the going power and the comfort. See, that's the thing that we sometimes get mixed up because there's so many people who paint the picture once you follow Jesus, Everything is going to be just peachy. But those who follow Jesus still get sick. Those who follow Jesus still suffer persecution. Those who follow Jesus still have to find a way to pay the bills. Those who follow Jesus still struggle from time to time. So how do you get through? You look for a city whose builder and maker is God. It's okay to put things up in this world. It's okay to have, have nice things. It's okay to leave things to our children and grandchildren. That is okay. But that is not what life is all about. We've got to look for that city who's built our maker's God and live in such a way to be there. Not that we ever gain it or earn it through our works, but one day he'll say, well done. But you've got to look for the city. You've got to look for that city. You got to, to look at the riches that are found in Jesus. There's so many more things that's worth that money cannot buy. It's worth more than all the gold and silver in the world. I had a saying, I, I'll, I'll give it to you. I'd pay a million dollars for peace of mind. But Jesus would give it to you for free. Isn't that a thought? That's a wonderful thought, isn't it? You don't have to worry about those things. Jesus already has it taken care of. It's like the song we sing. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. So he did that. And when times are tough, and they're going to get tough, and it's going to be hard, look to Jesus. He didn't have it any easier. He didn't have it any easier. I mean, really, he even had his best friend say he didn't know who he was. And he saw him. That's something to think about, isn't it? That's really something to think about. Look to him. You can make it through. Perseverance. Sometimes it's really hard to say self no and tell self let's go. But if we continue on, we'll not be ashamed. We'll not be ashamed. Today, where are you in this life? Are you looking for that heavenly city or are you trying to build an earthly kingdom? Are you looking for those riches that are found in Jesus or are you looking at the pockets? The things that one day will be burned up. Are you looking to Jesus to get you, out, get you through this life and into the next? Or are you only looking at self and what self can do? See, if we're not trusting in Jesus and walking according to his way, looking for that heavenly city. Why not do it today? All those other things are facades. They're fake fronts. 
It's almost as if he walked through Universal Studios and we saw all these sets where they did all this film. And none of that is real. And most of it isn't even a real house. It just looks that way. See, the world paints that picture for us, don't it? If you're not following Jesus, why not tonight? Why not today? If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you want to tell people he's the Christ, you want to change your life in accordance to that fact, we call that repentance. Put him on in baptism, have those sins washed away. Rise that, that, that water give a baptism, a new creation. Honor in Jesus and turn the back on the world. Or maybe you started that way and life got hard. You looked around, maybe you felt like you were alone and tried your best just to blend in, just to get through the day. Repent, pray, and come back and live for him today. It's not too late. Or maybe you have need for prayers or the like. You can come forward and let it be known as we sing this song of invitation.